Previously on UFC Prime Time. He doesn't like the pretentiousness of what he has to do in the media, and he'd rather not do it. He's actually trying to close parts of himself, preparing himself for war. It's kind of hard to come off respectable when you're dealing with fighting. The footage that, that you have of me that people have seen, it's, you know, it's, it's hardcore. It's not a joke. You really can't out crazy Nick Diaz. You just can't. I see the difference being the power that Carlos has. I think he's just a little bit too strong and a little bit too powerful. And I just think it's going to be a long night for Nick. Nick definitely has holes in his game. He kind of makes up for that by being able to take a lot of punishment. But the question is whether he's going to be able to take as much punishment as I'm going to dish out. I'm usually the first one here. My job is to be here before them, so this way I have everything prepared, ready. Well, I've been working for Nick since 2004. People come and look at him like, oh, he's in a bad mood. He's not. He's just focused and serious like any other fighter, and he wants it. I mean, on the street, he'll take his shirt off his back for you. But uh, in the ring, in the cage, he's an animal. It's an interesting conundrum that, that Nick is in, because he truly doesn't enjoy hurting people. He doesn't want to be the guy that's beating up other people. He doesn't think it's fun, but he does know that that's his job, to win fights. You've got to understand, he's seen it all, and he's fought the toughest guys in life and in the cage. Nick would take on uh, anybody and anything at any time, you know. He didn't get the best yet. Tomorrow, you better be ready to do it again. He had some behavior problems and also he had some gang problems. Gangs were trying to recruit him because he had a reputation of being tough and the gangs wanted to have him join up. He wanted to better himself, I could see that. When he didn't do his work, he'd have to do a few push-ups. Okay, you didn't do your homework, 25, give me 25. Let's do it. I wrestled when I was like 14, 13 in a park and rec thing. I was cutting weight for that because I was like two pounds over and I wanted to make the weight, you know. I was like, okay, I can do that. So I made weight for that. That was probably the first time I ever made weight for something. I must have been like 14 or 15. It was a wrestling tournament. I got f pinned by s first by some, some dude with his older brothers were there. They were like pinned me real quick. <laughs> you know what I mean? His brothers were there. They're like, they're like, they're like, man, you animal. They're like, and I was just like, oh man, I want to. I was like crying or something. I was like, not there, but I was like, had to take a walk. I was angry. I, you know, wrestling was not working out well for me. Uh, I mean, I liked wrestling. I wanted to be good at it. I just was having a hard time learning. I watched the UFCs. I ran into the tapes. I saw Hoist Gracie. I said, I can do this. I started doing jujitsu. Uh, somewhere when I was like 15, 16, sophomore year, high school. And um, that's when I met Steve Heath. I noticed immediately, uh, I teach a move, you'd do it right the first time. Taught him the same move, you'd do it better the second time. By the third time, he did better than me. And I'm training with Steve every day for months, and then he finally, I finally realized that he learned from Caesar Gracie. And I'm like, who's Caesar Gracie? And I'm like, you're telling me, like, there's cousins and, like, you know, I'm trying to figure out the whole family tree thing. When I first met Nick, he was a guy that, you know, he was hanging out with the wrong crowd. Jiu-Jitsu offered him an avenue to look at the world in a different way. He didn't relate well in school because they tell you you're going to do this homework, you're going to learn it the way we're going to teach you, and, and that's how you're going to do it or you're going to fail. And with martial arts, it was something that he could do his way. He would uh, start coming in every day. I asked him, I said, hey, aren't you supposed to be in school? And he goes, I'd rather come here and train. You know, uh, I have no interest in school. At age 16, Diaz dropped out, devoting himself full time to mixed martial arts. He trained religiously, jogging up to 15 miles a day and sparring against top pros. The wayward Nick Diaz was disappearing, emerging in his place, a world-class fighter. I got an aunts and uncles that 
they were into, uh, you know, a lot of natural foods and holistic medicines, and I thought it was a crock. I was like, are you serious right now? I'm like, you're feeding your kids rice cakes. I'm like eating, you know, at fast food, and I'm thinking it's the most wonderful thing. And until I started cutting weight and making weight and thinking about winning and losing fights, and then a lot changed. Without anybody pushing him and saying, hey, you know what, Nick? You need to go, you need to run. You need to go, you need to swim. He does it to himself. This is the drive. This is the desire. I think that's inside of his soul. If you go to his gym, you're going to see him showing techniques to little kids. And, and, and you will never even think that, that he is that bad boy that, you know, people want to portray him. We brought in Joe Schilling to help Nick get ready for uh, Carlos Condit. Joe is the current WBC Muay Thai world champion at 170 pounds. There's nothing that Carlos can do to Nick that Joe isn't going to do bigger, badder, harder, faster. Hi. Watch my body. When that kick is coming, I'm going to step to my right and I'm going to pivot this foot back. So I'm moving out of the way of it. Yep, you're not losing any power. He's basically opening up his toolbox. Uh, everything that he does to Nick, he's showing Nick how to defend it. Everything that he uh, lands on Nick, he's showing Nick how to land it on him. What people don't know about Nick is they, they see the hard persona, they see the tough guy, but he's a lifelong martial artist. He believes in the martial arts, and he will use anything. He'll use Taekwondo, he'll use boxing, he'll use Sambo, he'll use Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, he'll use Muay Thai. He's constantly evolving. People don't understand when it comes to mixed martial arts, Nick Diaz is a genius. They call BJ Penn the prodigy, they call Vitor Belfort the phenom. Those guys have off buttons, Nick Diaz doesn't have an off switch. That's all Nick does. He fights, he trains. What does Nick do for fun? He goes and runs a marathon. What does Nick do on his day off? He does a triathlon. The thing that hinders Nick in fighting is time limits. Stick Nick Diaz and GSP in a dark alley and see who comes out. We all know the answer. The only way you're going to beat Nick Diaz is you better bring a gun in the ring. For a fighter in the desert, there's not much to do outside the cage. Welterweight contender Carlos Condit turns to a relaxing pastime to take his mind out of the octagon. This is uh, Wes Mesa. What's up, man? How are you? Good, how are you? Got my buddy Ace and Dustin. Had a little bit of fun on my day off. We're gonna do an experiment. We're gonna have Ace, uh, Ace put a cup on. We're gonna see if it'll stop a bullet. Even if it doesn't, it won't hurt much, I guess. <laughs> You'd have to be a real good shot. <laughs> Now, the majority of my friends that I still have around, I've known since I was in elementary school and middle school. They knew me before I was successful with fighting. Fun. They're not just hanging out with me because I'm a UFC fighter. I've been shooting probably since I was about maybe 15 or so. I learned to shoot from a friend of mine who's, a, who's an instructor with the National Guard. If I wasn't a fighter, I think I, I would be in the military. I'm a warrior. That's 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 what I am, and I always knew I was. I think Ace has got me. I think he's he's a little bit better shooter than me, but he's a redneck, so that's uh, that's to be expected. At Jackson's, three generations of Condit men have arrived for today's session. The youngest among them, at 11 months old, seems as comfortable in the gym as his old man. Owen is just like his dad. Carlos was uh, basically a baby gym rat, and so was his brother. Come here, look right here. Owen is just a, it's just a natural environment for him. Oh, look at that. Well, Owen comes down to the gym with me quite a bit and, and just loves it here, which is, which is awesome. This, this is like a playground for him to go over and, you know, punch the bags and pretend that he's wrestling with everybody and he's just, you know, so into it. Let's get some water out of the pot. Come on. Oh. My dad's been a... Uh, a huge influence on me. When he saw that I really, really loved MMA, he would get off work early and he would take me to practice every day. He's been my biggest fan and biggest supporter since the very beginning. Oh, oh, what you daddy do? Don't fall down. Early in Carlos's career, after making the decision that he wanted to pursue uh, mixed martial arts as a profession, uh, I was, I was skeptical. But when I saw him living on the floor of a gym where he worked out, 
I knew that this guy had the determination to get somewhere. The fight persona and, and mentality is a subset of really what a human being is. Carlos is not as angry inside as he is focused and fierce. There's a difference. He's, he's still growing as an athlete and a professional and as a human being. It makes a dad very proud to see a, a son becoming a dad. And I really see that in Carlos. One of the most important and favorite things for the convict clan to do is to gather and, and cook and eat and visit. There's six brothers and sisters. Everybody's got a bunch of kids, and now my cousins are starting to have kids. So, you know, we're just, uh, we're multiplying. <laughs> this is what we do. 30 or 40 people get together for a quick spaghetti dinner. We've got three or four generations right here that within 20 or 30 minutes can kind of converge. The whole family gets together behind Carlos. As Carlos gets closer to fight time, when he's working like a sled dog, the nice and friendly and easygoing Carlos you still see, but less and less. And the focus and this place that he, he only goes to starts to emerge. He is fully focused and concentrating on fighting. But at the end of the day, Carlos will bring the world championship back to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Since their entry into the professional ranks, the Diaz brothers have used their growing stardom to support the 209, the area code in and around their birthplace, the notorious Stockton, California. Stockton got voted most miserable city in the United States. And despite that, these guys are saying we're not miserable. A lot of people in this area, when they make it, they leave and they end up leaving here and they never look back, you know, because it's a tough town out here. These guys, I can't get them to move out of here. I've tried, and, and they just said, no, we're gonna live where we're from. Despite all the hardships, they're, they're here to give back, and that's, that's the most impressive thing. Okay, go ahead and partner up, and then we'll do this move for a while. Okay. And we'll help you with that one. Same partner you had last. The brothers aren't just the most high-profile members of the Gracie Gym. They're instructors as well, helping run a local youth martial arts program much like the ones they joined as soon as they were old enough to fight. We did karate when we were little, we did Aikido when my uncle had an Aikido gym. Any type of martial art we could get into was just so great. I would just wish we could have nunchucks just like the movies, you know? And uh, Nick, Nick stepped it up. He went to Home Depot, because it was not far from my house, I remember, and he got some screws and some pieces of wood and he made nunchucks. He tied, taped them up with electrical tape. Nate looks up to Nick tremendously. Nick has always been the older brother leader that, that took Nate on this, this path, on this journey that they're on. Nate jumped in head first to that journey. He said, that's what my brother's doing, and that's what I'm going to do. Nick knew the, the avenue he took and what martial arts did for him. When he was uh, 17 years old, he said, Steve, I need to get my brother. My brother's hanging around with the wrong crowd. I don't want my brother getting involved in gangs. I go to him for advice on anything, you know? Sometimes he don't even know I'm there for advice. I'm sitting there getting it out of him. He's uh, put me on paths and directions that I, I didn't even know that he was putting me on, you know? Straight up, like, I got a boxing coach and a jiu-jitsu coach, but Nick's my MMA life coach, <laughs> straight up, you know? We understand each other and what we, what we need, and, you know, it's it's... Another thing, when you care about each other and, you're, and you already know that nobody's gonna screw each other over, this whole MMA is, is just one big, it's like anything, everybody's screwing each other over, left and right, backstabbing everybody, lying, pointing the finger. When you find your friends, you know, you wanna keep your friends close. The Diaz's have become polarizing figures in the UFC. Their fighting style consistently delivers action-packed brawls. When Nick Diaz smells blood like this, he swore, vicious hooks to the body. 
but their behavior has made them heroes to some, villains to many others. You know, you see them flip the cameras off when they're coming out for a fight or something like that, and really, that's them expressing themselves as saying, look, look at the size of this event. This guy's not gonna beat me. This show, as big as it is, is not gonna intimidate me. These TV cameras aren't gonna intimidate me. It's truly not a sign of disrespect, but one of more of them respecting themselves. It's a little disheartening when I hear people that say Nick Diaz is a gangbanger, he's a thug. Gangbangers and thugs don't have work ethic. Those kids work for everything that they have. They're tough guys when they need to be tough, but really, you know, they're not thugs. They don't have criminal records. They're not there out there stealing. These are guys you can trust with anything. These are loyal soldiers. The blood, the sweat, and the tears that these guys had to share coming up in this camp, you know, it's real. With their matchup just over a week away, Carlos Condon has entered the last phases of training for his showdown with Nick Diaz. The fight is one Condon never intended to have, but little has gone as planned in the months leading up to next weekend's interim title bout. I've promoted over 1,600 fights in my career. This has never, ever happened once. I mean, I don't even know what else to say. It's just, it's, it's, it blows my mind. Last fall, welterweight champ George St. Pierre was scheduled to defend his belt versus Diaz at UFC 137. But Diaz was a no-show at two pre-fight media events, prompting UFC President Dana White to make a switch. So Nick Diaz has lost his opportunity at the welterweight championship, and Carlos Condit gets it. St. Pierre, though, sustained a knee injury, and Diaz was suddenly back on the marquee, facing BJ Penn, where he administered a methodical beating on the former champ and earned a unanimous decision. But it was what happened after the fight that thrust St. Pierre back in the spotlight. Where you at, George? Where you at, everybody? I don't think George is hurt. I think he's scared. What's up? Where you at, George? Right after the fight, I begged Dana and Lorenzo to fight Nick Diaz, and I would not have let it go until they would have given it to me. It's the first time that I, that I asked them. I was begging them, like, give, give me that fight, you know? I've known George St. Pierre since 2004. He's one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Since 2004, I've never seen him like he was tonight. George St. Pierre flipped out tonight after Nick Diaz was in the ring. Nick needs motivation. He's got it. He's going to fight George St. Pierre. We got to come off like that just to get a fight in this. You know what I'm saying? I got to be the bad guy. You're going to point the finger, make me the bad guy. I'm the bad guy, and now I get a fight. But when St. Pierre was again sidelined, this time with a torn ACL, the UFC 143 card was reset. Nick Diaz would fight Carlos Condon for the interim welterweight title, and GSP would face the winner when his rehab was complete. So as both Condon and Diaz enter the final preparations for next week's bout, St. Pierre begins a journey of his own, the first day of intense rehab on his injured knee, with eyes toward a showdown that would settle a score. I pray every night that Nick Diaz win that fight. I'm always at my best when I'm pushed against the wall, when I'm fighting a guy that insult me and, 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 and question my integrity. It lights more fire in, in myself. Precious, I'm here. Step away from the window. And go back to sleep. With this injury, a lot of people are doubting. They say, oh, you're never gonna come back the same. A lot of people think Nick Diaz is much better than me. He act crazy, but he's not crazy. It's fake. It's a fake crazy. And I'm not afraid of him. He doesn't know where I come from. He doesn't know what I've been through to my life. I probably had more street fight than he ever had in his life. Believe me, I have my own demon in my head. People have no idea how dark I am in my head sometimes. Nick Diaz deserves to be beat down. In 
order to love fighting, I have to hate it. I know there's no love in this without hate. You gotta love it so you want it so bad that you're pushing yourself to those limits to where you just simply hate it. And if you ain't there to where you hate it, then good luck trying to love this. A guy like him should not be champion. He's gonna be champion for a few months if he wins a fight. But as soon as I'm gonna get it back, I'm gonna put my hand on him, it's gonna be done.